the president of the Massachusetts Senate, Karen Spilker, is our guest this morning. Let's go on the record. She's worked to guide the Commonwealth through the pandemic, and now with $5 billion in federal stimulus funds, she has a chance to set a new template for the state's future. How will the money be spent? Let's go on the record. From WCVB Channel 5, the inside word from Washington to Beacon Hill. Today's newsmakers are going on the record. And welcome to OTR. I'm Ann Harding along with New Center 5's political reporter, Sharman Sikedi. It's great to have you with us this morning. Our Janet Wu was off this weekend. The Senate President Karen Spilka is alongside this morning. Democrat from Ashland representing the 2nd Middlesex and Norfolk District. She has served as Senate President since 2018, a lawyer and advocate on mental health issues. She holds degrees from Cornell and Northeastern. It's great to have you with us, Madam President. Thanks, Thanks. for coming in. It's great, great to, to see be here. You. Here. Thanks for being here. Okay. So we'll talk about the stimulus spending in just a moment. But first, I want to start with the sweeping election reform bill that was just passed in the Senate. Mail-in voting, permanent. Uh, Same-day voter registration. That's also part of the bill. But that's going to face some pushback in the House and with the governor, isn't it? Uh, I, I don't know. I'm hoping that we can finally get that done. Uh, I'm very proud of this election reform, voting reform. We call it the Votes Act. Mm -hmm. It preserves, protects, and expands voting rights for all residents with the same-day registration, early voting, uh, mail-in ballots. It helps uh, expand voting for uh, people with disabilities, those that are incarcerated, our military we're looking at. And it's something especially in light of what so many other states are doing to curtail the voting rights of many people. We are truly trying to lift up to make sure that every voice, every vote counts across the state, whether you, you live in a big city or a person of color or whatever. Why include same-day registration knowing that it's really, uh, it faces an uncertain future? Why not? I, I believe that uh, there are 20 other states that do it. I know the governor said that he thought it was too complex to do. 20 other states and the uh, District of Columbia have same-day registration. Mm -hmm. I believe, I'm a little biased, Massachusetts has the smartest people in the country. If 20 other states and D.C. could figure it out, we can figure it out. So, so, so let's talk about uh, another thing that that maybe people at home might not be realized. But let's get you quickly on redistricting because because the, the clock is ticking. So far, that we haven't seen much of anything in terms of of a redrawn map yet. And then again, the, the state house remains in in COVID shutdown mode. So there there are a couple of conflicting things going on there. So what is going on with that? Uh, right now, the redistricting committee is working very hard. I know, and I give a, a lot of thanks to the hard, hard work of uh, Senator Will Brownsberger, the Senate chair of the redistricting, and Representative Mike Moran, the House chair. Uh, they have hel held many hearings across the state, met with many people, advocates, you know, elected officials, and, uh, and so many people, and senators. Uh, we have uh, right now, there are the principles, the um, data that is being followed. Mm -hmm. uh, there has been a push, and it's no secret, the uh, population has transitioned from the western part of the state towards the east. The east has increased in population. Uh, there have been shifts in population as well. So uh, I believe that, that we in the Senate uh, are, will follow the data, the law, right. uh, general principles of redistricting to make hopefully districts more compact. More, res more responsive and to resp the population. And, yeah, responsive. Uh, try to not have as many split communities, particularly mm -hmm. since this is the first time communities are doing their re-precincting after. I, I wanted to ask you this, the, just, just out of curiosity, the second half of that, uh, the point we were just talking about, the state house does remain closed because of COVID. I mean, are we, are, is this gonna be, you know, open-ended here, closed, or, or are we looking at opening up the state house? Because uh, it is, you know, the essentially the people's place in, in many, it's a business place too. Right, right. Uh, the state house is a museum. It's a uh, public speaking arena. It's a place of work. It's a tourist attraction uh, generally. And I was hoping to open it up more right after Labor Day. Right. However, uh, the primary focus that I have is keeping our staff and members safe, people who work in the State House day to day. So uh, we are having a vaccine mandate for 
sta Senate staff and, and members. The House came, we, we implemented that in August. The House did that recently as well. Uh, the governor has it for executive branch employees. So we are continuing to talk and we monitor it. Uh, so there, there will be probably a phased in reopening and we'll, we'll have to be but fluid. But it hasn't started yet, right? No. Right. Okay. But other states have managed to do it. Yeah. Actually, I was at a forum with other Senate presidents recently and I was surprised to hear most of the Senate presidents said that their state houses are still, at least the ones that were there, said mm -hmm. that their state houses are still closed because of similar concerns. Mm -hmm. and it, Let's, let's talk about the stimulus money because this does impact a lot of people. Five billion dollars in federal stimulus funds are available. Uh, Governor Baker has said he wants to spend a billion on the state's affordable housing crisis, housing the number one issue in the Boston mayor's race. Are you ready to spend that kind of money? Uh, we are taking a little bit of a different tact. I believe uh, history and we will be judged not at how fast we spend the money but how wise and efficiently we spend it. $5 billion seems like a lot of money, but it goes quickly. If you spend $1 billion on housing, $1 billion on something else, it, it goes quickly. Clearly, housing is a priority for the Senate. We've done major housing reform for years, uh, zoning reform. This is something we acknowledge. I hear it from senators, but we want to be transparent. We want, just like when we do a budget, we have hearings before we get public input, we get input from advocates, elected officials. The governor, the governor says, you know, this is the kind of thing you have to get in the pipeline early. Uh, so why not? Pretty much everybody acknowledges this is a crisis in Massachusetts. Right. So is mental health. We have a crisis in mental health. So is public health because of the pandemic. We have a crisis. So is climate. So we are trying to figure out the best way to spend significant amounts of money to have a bold and transformative approach in that area. And we are working closely with the House and we will get it done. Again, I don't think that the speed is what we're mm -hmm. judged on. It's how we effectively and wisely use the money. You, you, have, you have promised to help working families and, and focus on the concept of what's called intergenerational care. And, and basically, if you don't know what that is, it's building support facilities for children and senior citizens in, in effectively the same place. It, it seems to be an appropriate thought just in terms of what the what the world needs at this current moment. Right. And, and it was brought just like so many other mental health and other issues uh, got worse because of covid. Uh, I heard from so many parents, particularly mothers who had to drop out of the workforce mm -hmm. because they had to care for their children who were home, their parents, their parents too. Their lo right. or a loved one with a disability right. that right. couldn't go to, to some care out of the. So so how would it work? How could it work? I think there's lots of models, and, and we spent on Tuesday uh, a tour. Uh, Adam Hines, Senator Hines, is doing uh, the, he's chair of the Reimagining Mass Post-Pandemic Resiliency, and he just issued a really terrific report on a lot of the buckets, a lot of the areas that need a assistance, mm -hmm. and uh, we, we did an intergenerational tour. Swampscott, for example, has a senior a high school with a senior center and they they work together they do a lot of care together uh there's uh la salle college mm. had in New, a, a, yeah, yeah, yeah seniors living right there yep. in an in an in a home uh, in a big building on campus and they on campus yep. they take classes and there's a lot of interaction uh we developed family resource centers about 10 years ago they assist now families with children 18 and under. Families can go find resources, get an assessment of what kind of help maybe the family needs. We're doing a study, we put in the budget for a study. Can we expand them and mm -hmm. use them for all families so they can get resources and referred not only for their children, but for the, the parents, the seniors, the disabled, the sort of one-stop shopping and make it easier and more responsive for, for families.